Guests of the Altwire podcast are recorded remotely. Due to the nature of remote recording, the quality of our guest audio may differ between episodes. Although we go to great lengths to apply noise reduction and reverb reduction, certain issues may still remain. We appreciate your understanding and we hope you enjoy the show. Hello and thank you for tuning in to the Altwire podcast. I'm your host, Derek Oswald, and today we have a special guest joining us, the incredible Kaylee Morg. You may have heard her vocals on Mike Shinoda's latest hit, In My Head, which appeared on the Screen 6 soundtrack. In this episode, we'll dive into the stories behind her music, as well as the experiences that have shaped her remarkable journey. Also, if you've ever wondered what makes her tick or what shows she loves to binge watch, well, you're in for a treat, as we explore all this and more in this episode of the All Wire Podcast. The Outwire Podcast starts now. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing, Kaylee? I'm pretty good. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to have you with us. I wanted to start off by congratulating you on scoring such a big honor by appearing on the Scream soundtrack. Thank you. Not only was your voice featured in one of the biggest horror movies so far this year, but it also it held a big role in the intro and credits. As a noted fan of the Scream franchise, what emotions did you feel suddenly having a song that you performed on, lasting on thousands of movie screens worldwide? It was a lot. I mean, first of all, I hadn't seen it prior to like a private screening that we did. So I was in a theater doing a private screening with like the Linkin Park fans and my fans. Um, I had no idea like when it was going to play. I didn't know because I'm only really singing on the chorus. So I was like, I don't know what part of the song is going to play. And it was just so crazy to see the title sequence and have like see it saying scream and then it's my voice, <laughs> like the first voice that you hear. So it's just, it was a really weird moment. And it's like kind of funny because I think this whole experience has taught me that I'm a very um kind of calm, subdued person. Cause I was like, I'm screaming right now, but like on the outside, I'm kind of just like, oh my God, this is so cool. <laughs> so um it was definitely it was just a lot. It was very overwhelming because I do just love Scream. I don't think there's a better franchise to be in the opening credits of a movie. It was just such a big moment for me as like a horror fan, a slasher fan. And I would have gone and seen the movie anyways. I was so excited about Scream 6 coming out. Regardless, like I was just uh, even that much more excited to go to the theater and like hear my voice on in the movie. <laughs> it was surprising for me how early it featured in the movie as well, because yes, I'm into Linkin Park. I like Mike Shinoda's music. So I knew right. that he had some songs on soundtrack. So I sit down with my popcorn, I'm getting ready to watch it. And it's literally in the first five seconds of the film. I'm like, well, there's no better place to have a song than in the beginning of the film. That's what I'm saying. It's just awesome. And also like, I think there's just a whole other element to having a song in a show or a movie because um, I think music is really timeless as it is, but there's like, it's forever going to be something that people hear for years because this franchise is so famous and the movie is just also incredibly done. So it really like immortalizes this song in a way that I don't think I've ever experienced as an artist. So it's just really surreal. I loved it too. You know, it was one of those things where I got to be honest, when franchises go on, Sometimes they overstay their welcome. And when I saw that they were making a, a Scream 6, got to be honest, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, brother. You know, I was thinking, oh, great. You know, is this going to be any good or is it just going to rehash the same bullshit that every six movie in a franchise does? Because no knack on Fast and Furious. I know people like it, but we're 10 movies deep now. I think we're ready to put the nail in the coffin here. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, even Paranormal Activity to a certain extent, there's just like a lot of horror franchises specifically too where you're like around movie number four, like you're kind of tapped out. Like most people are like, oh, I've seen the sixth one or the seventh one. It's like 90% of the original viewers have not seen that. And it's just like, I think, I mean, I think that they did a really good job with Scream as far as bringing back the old cast and making it feel new, even though it is the sixth movie. Um, I think there's like, like the newer Halloweens are really cool. Like there's a cool way of doing it, but there's definitely, there's definitely people that drop the ball and it's like, okay, like we're on the 10th movie here. What are we doing? And I absolutely agree. I think Scream 6 is probably one of the better movies in the franchise. I think it almost was like a soft reboot, even though they didn't intend it to be so. They kind of made it so if they wanted to, they could go with that central cast of characters for the next few films. Also, it's 
it's the first one that's not in Woodsboro. And I like, didn't even really notice. Like, I don't know why until after the movie. Cause you know, like when there's like the Jason, what is that movie called? Like, I forgot the specific title. It's, he's in New York. I think it's yeah. literally called like Jason hits New York or something like that. <laughs> but I didn't like, I didn't notice that. I didn't feel like it was missing any of the charm of the old actors. Like, Nev Campbell not being in it like I thought was going to really make it feel so different and crazy but there's just it was really well done also it was like scary to me it was the first scream that I was like oh this is it's like funny at certain moments because I think that scream has always been kind of like a horror comedy but it was actually like kind of gory and and scary um which reminds me I need to go see Evil Dead but I'm like kind of scared (laughs) because it's it seems like it's legit scary so Evil Dead I'm gonna be honest with you it is a bit much I am the type of person where, although I don't get scared easily, I get very anxious. And the new Evil Dead had me a bit anxious, but it is one of the, I'd say one of the best horror movies in the last 15 years, actually. I've I've heard only great, great things. I was like surprised because I thought you were going to say you didn't like it for a second, but everyone is saying that they're going and loving it. I think I'm the same way where like, I actually, it's crazy that I'm kind of like a horror movie fanatic but I actually do get anxious in theaters because I think it's just like it's so loud I don't know what to expect also with Evil Dead it was we're talking about a franchise that started with like really almost comical practical effects you know what I mean so uh to see it be something now that's actually like terrifying that does scare me a bit because I'm like oh my god I, I mean the the trailers scare me and like not many trailers have scared me since I was like a kid so I, it makes me nervous for sure but everyone I've talked to about it says it's really really good so I definitely need to see it I love when like we're saying like reboots happen or these things that actually are great because there's a lot of uh, interesting ones. Very curious. How did the collaboration with Mike Shinoda for this track come about? Were you a Linkin Park fan before this? Yeah, I was actually. So I like had grown up listening to Linkin Park. I mean, my whole childhood was pretty much just rock music. And um, so that's why it's kind of interesting that I started off as like a dark pop artist and um, I know a lot of people like pivoted into rock and it was like kind of came out of nowhere, but it for me it was so natural because I've always loved rock music and alternatives. And um, I was such a huge fan of all these bands. Like Linkin Park was a band that I heard. I think they were just kind of unavoidable. Like it was so, they were so popular, so big. Th- these songs, like my sister would be playing, blasting that song numb in her room. And <laughs> like I would also hear it on the radio at water parks growing up. Like it was everywhere. So it was such a weird moment to be in his house and like recording this song we actually had met a year prior to this collab just because he does like he does a lot of research on like up-and-coming artists and reaches out and he's so talented like across the board even outside of Lincoln Park so he does like his Fort Minor stuff he does his Mike Shinoda stuff so he kind of just like reaches out to new artists and um like produces stuff wants to work with them write with them so we'd met a year prior and did a session and then I had gone off like about six months later and done a scream inspired music video. (laughs) And that kind of, I think like probably I'm assuming like planted the seed in his head. So six months later when this, um, he's looking for a female vocalist. Like I think my branding around then was just so built around horror movies. I had like Buffy the Vampire Slayer makeup on my album cover Um, It was also on brand and like Paramount loved me for it. So I think it kind of just clicked because of that. And then luckily, like when we went to go make the song too, it all like the vocal really elevated the song and I added harmonies and it seemed like, I mean, it ended up being exactly (laughs) what he had imagined, but I definitely was worried because I have like a very soft approach to how I sing. And he was like, all right, I need you to like scream. Like we did (laughs) a lot of, no pun intended, but we did a lot of, vocal takes it was a long day of just like nailing what the vibe of the song was I'm really happy that it ended up being not only like something that we both really really loved but something that seems to have resonated with the Scream fans because it is like a pretty central like moment in the beginning of the film it's played in the credits and we also didn't make a music video for it so we got to get super creative with like funny ghost face previews like leading up to the song coming out it was just it was a really fun time to like get creative with the marketing behind it
there are two schools of thought with Buffy fans. There are people who feel the show should have ended with season five, as was intended. And then there's other people who like the fact that they try to squeeze, you know, two more seasons out of it before ending officially. What side of the fence are you on? Okay, so I'm going to sound like such a, such a poser right now. Like everyone's going to call me out. I've only seen the first three seasons. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's going to be like, girl, you referenced this and haven't seen the whole show. And I'm like, listen, I have to be like, it has to be October. Like I go into my mode when I watch all these shows like around fall. And then when it comes to like winter, spring, summer, I'm watching different stuff. Like I'm watching like my 90s, like I'm watching Dawson's Creek, you know what I mean? <laughs> so um, I like, I kind of just slowly over time watch shows. I'm not like, I'm, I'm a binger when it comes to like true crime and drama, but with these comfort shows, it's more of like, I try to milk it and like watch it as slowly as possible. So it never ends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have only seen up to season three, but I, I felt that way about shows before. So I think I'm, I'm sure like once I arrive there, I usually am on the side of like preserving a show if it means like ending it sooner, just because yeah. I think sometimes there's a lot of shows that went to shit once they're trying to like delay the ending. They want to make more episodes, more money. Like it just, the writing kind of, isn't true to how the actual story would have been like the characters kind of start changing. So that's usually how I feel about um, that stuff. Like even there's shows that you watch like freaks and geeks, for example, it's one season. And I'm like, I don't think it, if, if it were to have like deviated or had this, the story wouldn't have been that great. Like maybe it should have just been one season. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, I'm definitely on the side of um, preserving shows. If it means like staying true to the writing. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I too have not completed Buffy. Okay. Okay. I got I was like, oh my God. <laughs> the middle of season six and this drives my girlfriend nuts. We go head first into a show, watch it for a while. And then I go, you know, I think I kind of need a break from this. So we go and start another show and then we never return to it. Me too. It's so funny. We only just recently finished Sons of Anarchy. I've been watching Supernatural and I'm up to season eight. Oh my God. I think we're going to finish it without taking a break. That's crazy. I mean, that's a long run right there. That's like... <laughs> oh my God. It's a grind. I mean, if it makes you feel better, like every... Like, okay, so I'm on season two of Succession and everyone's freaking out about it. Like the new season. And I still am like, I'm, I just need to be in the right mood to watch it. Like I am such... I used to... It's crazy because I used to be able to really like watch six seasons of a show and like be... Like I can run through it and now that I'm an adult I think <laughs> like I just have other things to do and like I like to I just like when I watch a certain show I sometimes need a break and need to watch something that's in a completely different genre and like different vibe and then come back to it um because sometimes that's something with the Buffy thing like I will appreciate it more when I've given myself a little bit of a break and I come back to it and I um am not just watching it to get through it like I'm watching it because I miss how it feels and I like how the the story is developing but yeah sometimes those it's it's rough like that's why I, I don't know if I'll ever watch Game of Thrones because I feel like there's so much ground to cover that I just don't know if I can ever like sit through it I will give you the following advice when it comes to Game of Thrones okay I started and stopped that show three times okay. because the first season has a lot of buildup and it was one of those things where every single episode of it feels like a full-length movie even though it's only an hour Mm -hmm. It's one of those things where it was like, I kept on getting fatigue and, you know, finally, you know, girlfriend just said, look, just stick with it. Trust me. It's worth it. And it took a while, but yeah, we got through it and it was great. I liked season eight. Best thing I can say without spoiling it is that the reason people don't like season eight is because they feel a certain turn within a certain character was no pun intended out of character for that person. But my whole point is, if you watched their family history and the lore around their family in the show, you should have seen it coming. So for anybody to suddenly be like, oh, that's out of character. I'm like, have you been paying attention to the entire show? <laughs> have you ever seen uh, Have you ever seen Weeds? Oh, you know what? It's kind of funny. Speaking of Lincoln Park, there was one season of Weeds where I don't know if they did it all the time, but if it was just one season where 
They had a different artist doing the theme song and Linkin Park did one of those. Why did I not know that? Oh my God, I need to Google this. It's because it sounds nothing like Linkin Park. When you finally hear it, you're going to be surprised. Like you'll hear it and you'll be like, oh yeah, that's Chester. But he sings in such a high voice, almost like a lullaby that when you hear it, you're like, oh, that's Linkin Park. I, I literally can't even picture him singing that like, because it's like little boxes on the hillside. <laughs> that's crazy. That's even more full circle because that's like my favorite show ever. I brought that up though, because I was going to say season five of Weeds is like really hard to get through. It's like, I think every show has that one season that you're like, okay, like I have to make a decision here if I'm going to just never finish the show ever, if I'm going to get through the season. I don't know if it's season three or season five. There's one of the seasons where it's just like such a departure that it's like outrageous. It's like, okay, I don't, I don't know what's happening here. Um, but it's, it's a really good show. That's interesting. I'm definitely curious. I'm like, I want to hear this. Little boxes on the hillside. Little boxes made of ticky tacky. Little boxes on the hillside. Little boxes all the same. There's a green one and a pink one and a blue one and a yellow one and they're all made out of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. And the people in the houses all went to the university where they were put in boxes and they came out all the same. And there's doctors and lawyers and business executives and they're all made out and they all look just the same that's crazy i love that they kind of were like oh we're gonna do this theme song but then they were like it's not gonna sound like lake and park at all like you guys are not gonna get what you want like it's just gonna be our this kind of cool take on it like i kind of love that they did that you know you being a fan i think you'll agree one of the my favorite things that the band has ever done is one more light and the reason why is because it pissed so many people off Oh yeah, we t- we've talked about this. <laughs> you and Mike talked about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just because I I think it's I think it's just funny to like do things as an artist. It's like when you have so many expectations and people that are expecting something of you. Like it's so I don't think there's anything more like rock and roll than just being like I don't care. <laughs> like you're like this is just kind of hilarious. <laughs> I think that's why I respect artists that do that. Like I'll be completely honest. I'll probably get some hate for this not 100% a fan of the direction Paramore has gone in, but I Mm -hmm. applaud them heavily for not sounding like quote unquote Paramore. Because there are some bands where they'll, they'll ride that train their entire career. They might change things a little bit, maybe add a synth here or there, but they're the same band the entire time. Also, I think it's like, I think it's so interesting when people don't understand that, like for Paramore, for example, like you said, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be your cup of tea because it is not really like the same band anymore. But it's like, this is, we're talking years now since they put out their first two or three albums, like that really defined what Paramore is. They're all older. They're all like in their mid to late thirties. They're like, okay, are we really going to like be the same thing for so many years? And I think like as a listener, you might not know that like as the artist, we have to evolve and we have to change because that inspiration if you're doing the same thing for 15 years like you're not gonna even care to be writing these songs anymore because it's like I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again and like I've even done versions of that I've changed the course of what my sound is what I'm writing about what I'm right my hair looks like like I'll change I'll reinvent myself completely for the sake of staying inspired and like finding that um spark as an artist because it's you it's always going to be a means to an end if you are never evolving. So I, I do always have like respect for people that just like pivot completely and are like, no, I'm going to do this now. And whoever likes it, likes it. Whoever doesn't, I don't care. It's like so, so necessary as an artist to do that. What was it like working with Mike Shinoda as a producer? What are some takeaways and things that you learned from him? Not just, you know, in the studio, but having conversations like you mentioned. What were some of your biggest lessons from him? I mean... As far as like, yeah, in the studio, he's just, he's a very smart person. And I think there's a lot of actual like strategy that comes to recording songs. There's different like notes that he was giving me um, for singing and like how we, we even just wrote a track the other day, like just aside from him and I collabing just to like produce some stuff for me. And like, he's, 
has such an interesting way of looking at music and like saying what you want to say um, in a way that is kind of like still like you're still thinking about strategizing and like well what does this song really mean like yeah we can sit here and pour our hearts out but like how are we packaging this into something that relates to everyone because I definitely (laughs) I definitely will write things sometimes that are so obscure and like so personal that I box myself into something that not everyone can understand and I think that that even speaks to like Linkin Park and how they kind of like just connected with so many people because there's a line between being so so personal and writing about these situations and including everyone in that um so he's really like taught me that and I also think just as a human like it's been so refreshing and kind of like restored my faith in humanity that someone that is that successful and has like everything is he's just a nice person and I think it's like there's no reason for him to be seeking out up and coming artists and helping people and doing all that, but he's choosing to do that. And it's like so inspiring to see his house and, um, you know, meet his kids and like see what he's built from music. Because I think so many artists are like right now, especially with, you know, touring is weird. I think like, it's just hard. It's hard to be an artist. It's hard to make money. It's hard to be vulnerable um, and do this all the time. So it's just really like, pushed me to continue doing this and like continue fighting for it because he's just like built such an amazing thing from music and being passionate and being a good person. So it was just like so cool that he's not an asshole because I was like, there's so many people like that that are so um, successful and like forget that it's free to be kind. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I think that was one of the, the biggest things that I worried about growing up and, you know, wanting to get into music reporting and eventually doing a music podcast, I always heard the old adage, never meet your idols. And you're absolutely right. It's free to be friendly. You don't have to be an asshole, especially to somebody who looks up to you or wants to learn from you. And I've been thankful, knock on wood, that the majority of people I've spoken to have been very genuine, very friendly, but, you know, hasn't always been that way. Speaking of people that inspire you, You've also made no secret of your love for the pop icons of the 1990s and the 2000s. What icons have inspired you the most and what aspects of that era of pop culture resonate with you the most? Oh my gosh, don't get me started. Here we go. I love, so a lot of the time I've been like in saying, bringing up these artists is when I'm talking about my last album specifically, but I've always been so, so obsessed with the 90s, obsessed with these figures. So with my last album, I was, really like diving into Alanis Morissette specifically because I think there's something about that era that's so charming because all of the pop stars and rock stars were just like normal people and they like for Alanis to do massive massive shows and come out on stage in baggy shirts and jeans like that's so badass to me that's so like that's such a rock star statement to me that she would just like minimal makeup, whip her hair around, just be like so unapologetically feminine in a way that's not like cutesy and I have to be sexy. And this, like, she kind of was just like, like, I'm going to get on stage however I'm comfortable. I'm going to write about things that maybe you don't want to hear and you're going to be okay with that. And like her biggest songs were these unapologetic anthems of her just being angry and um, real and like there's so many songs too that I think like I personally and other artists can relate to of hers where she's talking specifically about labels about men in the industry that like forget her name and only care about like just talking to her and being weird and flirty and uh, there's so many things that are so specific to being a woman in the music industry that are so cool I also really like Liz Fair um, she's kind of in that same era she actually has like a book called horror stories kind of about different like vignettes of her life as an artist and and a woman um and there's just like there there's something about like female pop acts at that time that was just so uh genuine and there was no like untouchable I'm wearing sequins and bras and like all these crazy you know pieces that separate me from you like I'm on stage with like a backup dancers like they were all just kind of like might as they could have been anyone in the crowd that just walked up on stage you know what I mean there there was there was this line of um 
transparency of the nineties. And that's why like what I called it at that time was to be like nineties norm core. That's like exactly how I dress during my girl next door era, because I was like, I'm embracing like kind of mundane things. I'm embracing being a, an artist that like, isn't putting on the glitter and the jewelry and all this stuff to, um, make myself seem more interesting, which is like no knock to anyone else. It's just that it's not real for me to do something like that. Like that's not who I am. So I was like, okay, I don't need to like go on stage and have like sequins and all these things and act like I'm some like untouchable diva because I'm awkward. I make jokes on stage. I like, well, I'll point out when I mess up, like I'm very transparent. And for me, the nineties is only people like that, that were like, I'm going to be human. And like, you're still going to listen to my music and connect with it because that's like what I'm writing about and what I'm trying to do. So yeah, I just find it very charming, that whole era. I also love like wrestling from that era. It's like the Attitude Era. I think it's so cool. It's like everything around them in pop culture, like I'm just obsessed with. When you say wrestling, it just makes me laugh. I will always have a soft spot in my heart for Macho Man Randy Savage. I have a soft spot for like everyone in that era. Like again. This is, we're talking about like a year ago that I was like, so, so into the nineties. So it's been a while, but like, I would just put on all of the old matches and like, um, Helen cells, that what it's called just for the vibes, the nostalgia. Cause also my, my dad is like super into wrestling. So it's more just like a family thing, but I think it's hilarious. Like I, I'm honestly really glad that like WWE is kind of making a comeback and all these like influencers and YouTubers are trying it. Cause I'm like, why not? Like, it's, it's really so ridiculous and so funny. Uh, like Johnny Knoxville was on WWE like a couple years ago and it was so great. Like I just, cause I love Jackass too. So it's just like all my favorite things sometimes overlap and it's just amazing. <laughs> like I said, I think it's awesome that WWE is like so important to people again. And that like new, this new generation of kids get to see like YouTubers and stuff on there. But there's just something about the mystique in, of these characters at that time that was just so like, it was so important. Like even like, just like there, there will never be somebody like the undertaker. There will never be somebody like stone cold. Like there's just, there's, there were these, these people were like pop stars in their own way. Like these were rock stars. <laughs> like these were like huge, huge figures that they were just it was so cool and so interesting. Um, I think it's like, and maybe that was just kind of going from the eighties and like going from hair metal and just like this super costumey era of style and pop culture um, that burst like the nineties, which are so great. Uh, Cause they were just like, okay, now like we're getting rid of all the costumes. We're getting rid. It's like just going to be like kind of funny, stupid shit. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I absolutely adore that era. So speaking of girl next door, since you were talking about how part of that was inspired by that whole nineties feel and aesthetic in a note you wrote for that album, you expressed that the album began as an attempt to change your perspective and get past your grief and insecurities looking at the person you were starting out versus what you've now become, how would you frame your current perspective on life? Yeah, I guess like everything is just, I think in the, in simple terms, it's really was more of a transitioning phase of my life from being kind of going from being like a teenage girl, um, having like the hardest, hardest year of my life when I was 20, I like lost somebody really close to me. I decided to um, get sober because I'm struggling with like alcohol addiction and drug addiction. And so I, I had a lot of things pivot for me when I was 20. And um, some of the songs I wrote for, or like about 21 actually. So some of the songs I wrote for Girl Next Door yeah. started around then. And um, the first one on the album that I ever wrote, which is like what I didn't intend it to be on this album. Like I didn't know what I was making at the time was, but it was Loser. And that track, like you can even tell that being the first song I wrote, it's so negative. And so just like giving into what everyone thought about me, giving into like how my dad spoke about me. So I was very, at the time, indulging in this like hate for myself and just like, oh, like I'm not going to amount to anything. Like I just, I have these addiction issues. I'm like, I have all these other issues. Um, and kind of like just, yeah, I guess like being a big baby and just being, well, I'm just going to be sad about this. <laughs> and I think, Towards the end, like one of the the last songs I wrote for the album was a Good Day to Be My Dealer, which is like also kind of like that, but it's way more witty. Like I had this humor that started to change over time where I was kind of like, is it that deep though? Like it's kind of funny. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's kind of hilarious. 
Um, and I think you have to lighten up as a human, as an adult, because like there's things now where I'm almost 25 now that like if I handed 17 year old me, like some of the things that have happened to me now, like she would have been like, oh my God, I can't do this. Like she would have been freaking out. And now it's just like, there's a certain lightness to how I view things and how I feel because um, I can just like roll with the punches more. I think I really have experienced like loss, for example, in a way that makes you so appreciative of what you have. Um, and it make, made me feel so like silly, I guess, for being so sad about my little issues when there's things that are so much bigger than me at work. And there's like people that are, you know, like there's just, there's a, there's a lot more important things than like the small things that I chose to focus on and spiral about. So like, I'm really have practiced like having positive self-talk and um, kind of like believing that I can do this music stuff, believing that I'm going to be okay because it starts there. Like if I don't believe that any of this stuff's going to work out, if I don't believe that like life is great and I'm just like pretending that I think that, then it's never going to change. Also, my dad's a therapist. So this is like a constant conversation. <laughs> this is like in my ear constantly. He's like, no, like you have to like, he like the, one of the best things he ever taught me, there's two things was you have to know the truth about yourself and you decide what those truths are. Like, if you think you're smart, you think you're capable, like you will be those things and you will decide those things. And those are your truths. And no one can shake them from you. Like no one can call, if someone calls you stupid, then you're like, all right, like, I know my truth. I know I'm smart. So that he taught me that. And so that instilled a confidence in me. And then also he taught me, and this is like really the turning point to be present because he's like, yeah, like when you're at the grocery store and you're like waiting in line to pay for groceries, like you can do one of two things. You can be like annoyed and impatient and like, oh, like I just want to do this and I'm constantly waiting to get out of the store so then I can go eat and I'm waiting to meet up with this person. It's like you're constantly waiting for things or you can like be there and treat everything as an experience, not just like the things that you want and the things that you're waiting for. It's like every small thing is an experience and like life is just great, grand scheme. So, uh, yeah, it's been a perspective change of like, when you're an adult, you have to kind of realize that like things aren't that deep, <laughs> like all these small things can be great. So that's like my little tangent. Cause, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a, a really long few years of like internal therapy and just like changing those things. Cause you can't, can't like dwell on everything. I think when you're kind of in your mid twenties and like approaching adulthood, you have to like like, okay, like what's happening here? Like, this is kind of not that, that crazy. That's a hard lesson to learn. I had Andrew Hagar on the podcast before you, and he talked about the same thing, about how important it is just to not only try to see, be present and see the positives and things, but also the importance of having a therapist. Now, for you, it might be a little more weird because your dad's a therapist, so he's probably always trying to psychoanalyze you, but you know. Would you say having a dad that's a therapist is more helpful or more harmful, if you had to say? Um, my dad, okay, so the thing is, like, he's so emotionally intelligent that he doesn't psychoanalyze us because he's like, I I almost, like, for him, that's, like, working off the clock. <laughs> he's like, that's going to be $300 an hour, actually. Uh, I'm just kidding. So, uh, yeah, he's he's he is, like, really respectful about boundaries obviously of just like I'm not gonna diagnose you with something just because like I'm your dad you know what I mean I, I think that if anything he just gives really really great advice like I, I I will he won't like seek out any sort of like kind of issues and try to like pry it's more like I'll kind of have a conversation with him and um get advice and he's it's crazy because before he was a therapist he was always like the best person to go to for advice so he just already has had this like crazy emotional intelligence since I was as long as I can remember and um now that he's a therapist it's like he has the actual terminology and specific uh kind of like things that they little acronyms and things they tell you in therapy but he it's been really cool it's he's only been like a actual therapist for like three or four years which is like right when I needed it <laughs> so I was like this is great so yeah it's been it's cool because it's just like more for advice and also in general like just talking to my parents is always really cool because uh I think like they've lived they've lived like double the amount of life that I have so whenever I'm like dwelling on something or think something is the end of the world like they're kind of just like girl it's it's really not <laughs> like really you're gonna be fine because they just have so much more experience and like I really do 
take what they say with so much weight because they just, they just know more than I do. And like, there's a lot of things like even, you know, like younger siblings or teenagers now, like if they're saying something that like, as somebody that's kind of lived a little bit more life, you're like, okay, you just wait, like you'll, you'll learn at some point, but like everyone has to go through those things. So I always like kind of take what my parents say with a, a lot of weight for that reason. And don't you worry about overthinking things because I'm 36 and I still do it. I just think it's a natural part of the human emotion, especially, you know, you and I were both anxious people. So, you know, they both let that feed into who we are as people. Yeah. And I think people that like care about art a lot and like music and all this stuff, like we're both into, it's like you, it's almost worse because as an artist, like I'm just already like thinking of everything constantly and like that's how it turns into art. Um, but I also don't want to completely cut off that part of my brain because it leads to great things. You know what I mean? So it's just like, it's the artist way, I think. And over the last few years, since you're in this period of discovering who you really are in your self-discovery, what is something that you discovered about yourself and your music journey so far that has perhaps been unexpected? I think, I don't know if I've had any like epiphanies. I think if I have... I haven't thought that much about them, <laughs> but I, I've definitely like, I think it's less about like specific things that I've realized and more so that I'm changing constantly. I think um, music changes constantly. The pop landscape changes, the rock landscape changes. Everything is at such a high speed that it's like every six months or a year, I'll kind of pivot um, just slightly. And like, it's been really fun to, know that about myself now I think so I guess it kind of is like some sort of realization that I am like constantly excited to see who I'm gonna be and like what I'm gonna want to say sonically every six months to a year because it changes and I think it does for everyone like where the next project you make you're gonna be talking about different things and uh you'll want to like reference different artists and um it's just like it's really fun that it's never it's just the best job to have really (laughs) because it's like it's never the same and I've really like kind of nurtured that part of myself versus being um, frustrated that I'm constantly like wanting to do different things because I think it can get really overwhelming if you can't like pin down what you want. But I actually think it's like a really great skill to um, understand so many different, you know, sounds sonically and musically that like you can't, it overwhelms you. Like that's such a great thing to have where you're like, I just want to do so many things that I have to pin down like one at a time what I want to do. But it's just like really fun to never know what I'm going to be doing in six months from now. It's like kind of scary, but also really exciting. You know, you, you want to do so many different things, especially genre wise. What's a genre that you would like to dip into next if you had the option of choosing? Um, so I kind of am doing something super secret um, that mm. I, I, will say, yeah, I will say, um, no one knows about it, but I will say that the genre that it dips into is um, kind of this like 80s, like synthy goth type thing, which I'm so, it's just so cool to do stuff that you've never done. And it, it inspires so much stuff that you wouldn't have otherwise thought of. I think it would also like, this is not something, this is not super secret. Like I'm not working on anything like this, but in the future, I, I, I'm one of those people, like, I don't know why I would love to do country music at some point. Cause I just love country music. I think that like, there's so many people that would be like, that's horrid. And why, are you, why would you want to do that? But I just like, I think it's cool. I think there's a lot of classic country. Like when I'm saying country, I'm not going to be like a radio country act. Like I would, I love Johnny Cash. I love a lot of, um, classic country that I think is just so incredible. Like I, I guess on the more pop side, like I love Casey Musgraves. I think there's a lot of really cool things to reference there. Um, but I just, there's no genre that goes untouched for me. Like I, I really just want to do everything, but in the immediate, yeah, I've been working with, uh, I've been doing a lot of like synthy stuff, a lot of like more dance pop, um, for something, something else. And I'm really, really excited about it. So it's been fun. And hey, everybody has their folk country album. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Like I I could just do it, really. Exactly. So I know you're still a relatively younger artist, but if you had to think, because I love asking this question, what is one of the funniest memories you've had so far? I'm like, I have no idea what like a funny experience of mine has been. I'm trying to think. I guess like the funniest stuff is like always on tour usually. (laughs) It's like, like tour is just such a weird it's like I don't think people know that like 
humans just aren't built for touring. It's like, it's really just insane. Like the last tour I went on, um, it was just, it was so, it was just a lot. Like <laughs> the last tour I went on, um, we were, it was like me and my manager and a drummer and we we're all in a minivan. So like, there's so many things that happened that I didn't talk about. Like we got pulled over by the cops because they thought we had drugs in the van just because we had like a huge we just had a huge drum kit and like a minivan with three women. And we're like, we're officer, like we're, we swear we're not smuggling anything. We're in Kansas right now. <laughs> like we're just like, I don't know what to tell you. Um, and then there was like, you know, there's a couple nights, not going to lie. Um, like, you know, things got a little crazy. They had to drag me out of a bar. <laughs> like, there's like, uh, there was one morning I like threw up like six times. Like their tour is just like, it's brutal, but it's so fun. I think, um, you know, there's like, such funny moments that happen on stage like tracks actually know it was really fun is I um did a college show in Minnesota recently and they were like yeah it's called the spring jam like it's gonna be it's kind of like to welcome this the spring and like it's it's when it finally gets hot out it's gonna be so fun it was 25 degrees <laughs> 25 degrees so like I get on stage and I'm like I have to wear my jacket and like I'm wearing gloves and I'm like shaking um, but it was so fun. Like, that sounds like it's like nerve wracking, but it was actually so funny because like I was just jumping around like purely for the warmth. And it was like, I gave no, I just did not care at all because it was just so ridiculous and so cold. And like everyone in the crowd was just like, like, they're like, Ooh, like we're, we're trying to hype you up because we know this shit sucks. Like it's so cold. So um, there's just a lot of moments like that that end up being like my favorite moments because it's so human and like so just kind of hilarious that um I love like being candid on stage I love making jokes um I like it I get a kick out of it like I'm a comedian for a second <laughs> like I just I, I like um when things go wrong sometimes it's just like pure comedy to me I did open your reddit subreddit I don't know if you know you have a subreddit but you do I think I haven't checked it in a long time <laughs> and I opened up questions to them and as asked on Reddit, are you still actively practicing witchcraft for the sake of your creative process? Ooh, yeah. So this is a, this is an interesting one. No, actually, I don't practice anymore. I didn't start practicing though for music. So I think like, I'm not sure if people, I think people started finding out that I practice because I had talked about it in relation to my music. I had, like started talking about witchcraft. I made a music video kind of inspired by witchcraft. Um, and I had like a video go viral where I was talking about doing a spell for a song, but I, I kind of just something in me, I practiced since I was 17. That's why I was saying like, it's not really, it wasn't about music. It was just something that I did for six or seven years. Like nothing, there was nothing that happened that I was like, I need to stop doing this. But I just last year, like I found where it was about 14 months and I like never did a, hadn't done a spell, hadn't done a ritual. Like I was like, oh, like I think, I think I'm just kind of growing out of this. Like it doesn't feel like something I'm, I'm passionate about anymore. Um, I also come from a very religious family. So I, I think like I personally, this is like no dig to anyone that does witchcraft. This is like my own issues. I felt like I was like trying to fill a God-shaped hole with witchcraft. Like I was like, oh, like me doing these rituals and spells is like me praying. Like this was me like trying to like, take control over my own spiritual experience. Um, so I think, yeah, I just like, I just felt kind of disconnected with it. But for a while, yeah, I was, I was uh, practicing. I still have like, I still have all my, my stuff. Like I have a crystal ball over here, right here. I have like candles. I have the whole shebang. I just like kind of took a break for a while. I think it's, um, I don't know. I'm very much like everything in my life is kind of fluid and I kind of play it by ear and like, it didn't just hasn't felt like something I've connected with for a bit, but I did definitely do it for a while. <laughs> I think that's cool. I actually like haven't been able to discuss that. So I think that's really interesting. Perfect. Just to wrap up the podcast, is there anything else that you would like to share with people listening in? What does the future hold for Kaylee Morg? Ooh, well, first of all, um, thank you for listening this far. I always like want to like, give people a little treat of like thanking them after a long interview. <laughs> thank you for being here. And, you know, stream girl next door, stream in my head. Um, me and Mike have been working on some stuff I'm really excited about. The whole Kaylee Moore project is just something that I've had a lot of fun exploring and and figuring out what the next sound is. I've been kind of digging into like 
some queen inspired stuff, some like fifties inspired stuff. Um, so we're definitely putting together some sort of project there. And then, like I was saying earlier, I have a kind of super, super secret side project that's in the works that works that I'm beyond excited for. And it just feels like it's going to be massive. So, um, just keep an eye out, I think, and look for any Easter eggs because they will be there. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of this episode. I'd like to thank Kaylee for joining us today and for being such an incredible guest. Please be sure to stream her debut album, The Girl Next Door, as well as her collaboration, In My Head with Mike Shinoda, on streaming services worldwide. My name is Derek Oswald. Thanks for listening.